5.12 in the morning, April 18th, 1906, in the largest city of the far west, west of Chicago. It's a quiet city, a 19th century city, whiffs of fog in the air, a few people staring about, one person swimming out at Ocean Beach, beginning of the unloading of produce in the produce district, constables walking their beats, some Navy boats offshore. Everything quiet, a city coming slowly to consciousness, gas lamps still lit, a city coming awake, and then a tremendous jolt. Contemporary accounts uh, say that in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, as people came out onto the street, there was a mood of shocked silence, of awe. If you were in the downtown, most of the major buildings uh, would have survived with the conspicuous exception of City Hall, which would have been surviving only in its dome atop its steel structure. However, if you were in the neighborhoods of San Francisco, uh, where the construction was of wood, you would have seen row upon row of collapsed houses, the facades pulled away, people's private rooms revealed. If you were at the Valencia Street Hotel, you would have seen uh, the collapse of a, of a major structure, and you would have perhaps begun to hear uh, the cries of those uh, trapped beneath the debris. The 1906 earthquake represents the birth of modern earthquake science in this country. While we have a pretty good idea what happened in 1906, we really want to know what happens when that same earthquake repeats today. And in order to understand that, we have just undertaken the most comprehensive analysis of what actually happened. How did the ground move during the 1906 earthquake? And we're doing this because we not only want to know how strong the ground moved, we want to know how long it moved and also what frequencies did it excite in the earth. And that's important because it tells us which buildings or which infrastructure might be damaged. This animation shows the ground motions for the greater San Francisco Bay Area. The rupture began two miles off the coast of San Francisco at a depth of six miles. The seismic waves reached the surface at approximately one and a half seconds. As the waves propagate, the darker areas show how fast the ground is moving at any particular time. The coloring you are seeing corresponds to the intensity of the shaking, with the most intense shaking corresponding to red, which is motion associated with two feet per second. The darker orange corresponds to one foot per second. The rupture continues towards the south for nearly 54 seconds, and the rupture also continues to the north for 90 seconds. Here's another view of the shaking along the San Francisco Peninsula. The rupture begins two miles off the coast of San Francisco, and within two and a half seconds, strong shaking has enveloped the entire city. At approximately 6 seconds, strong shaking reaches San Mateo, and 12 seconds, the shaking has reached Palo Alto. This strong shaking is propagating at nearly 8,000 miles an hour. At approximately 20 seconds, strong shaking reaches the San Jose area. This view shows that the most intense shaking is concentrated along the San Andreas Fault. However, there are other isolated areas, such as the Cupertino Basin and Santa Rosa, that have very strong shaking away from the fault. We studied two earthquake scenarios. First earthquake scenario is based on information provided by the USGS, which is our best information on how the ground shook uh, in 1906. Uh, so that's a look back in time. The other scenario that we used was a uh, M7 or magnitude 7.9 event on the San Andreas, and it's our best estimate of what will happen next time. This study was uh, performed using the HAZUS technology, which was developed by the National Institute of Building Sciences for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. It's a very comprehensive earthquake loss estimation technology. Uh, we worked uh, very hard to improve the default uh, building inventory and default building damage and loss functions. This study produced a large number of results. Uh, in particular, if we look at the number of damaged commercial buildings, we see it's 10,000, which means we're going to have a severe impact to our, our businesses. Uh, in terms of displaced households, we estimate close to a quarter of a million displaced households, which means that a lot of folks will need uh, temporary public shelter. Uh, in terms of casualties, we know at, at nighttime there is uh, as many as uh, eight, 1,800 
uh, folks uh, that will be killed. Uh, and it, it's worse during the daytime because the more vulnerable buildings are the ones we work in, as much as 3,400 people will die. If we uh, put uh, dollars to this, uh, this uh, picture, we find that in Alameda, uh, the direct economic loss to buildings is around 15 billion, San Francisco 34, San Mateo 26, Santa Clara 28 billion. All the other counties add up to only about 18 billion, and the total loss for the entire 19 county region is around 120 or so billion dollars. Earthquakes affect buildings in different ways. There are, are two or three kinds that are particularly vulnerable. These are buildings that have been built uh, prior to the 1970s that are were of a style of construction that people thought was earthquake resistant. And in recent years, we've learned that they're not. One of them is called a non-ductile concrete building. That's a, a concrete building, concrete columns and beams, much like the building that's behind us here, uh, without the braces, because this is a building that's been strengthened. Uh, the concrete doesn't have enough reinforcing steel inside, and so as the building shakes and it sways, the concrete starts to break up. And as it breaks up, then the reinforcing steel buckles, and the building can undergo severe damage and even collapse. Another one of the building types that's extremely vulnerable in earthquakes, and it's real prevalent in the Bay Area, is what we like to call soft story residential construction. This is something that we saw in the Loma Prieta earthquake in, in 1989 when buildings down in the Marina District were so seriously damaged. There are apartment buildings or townhomes that are built on top of garages so that the whole first level is open. It has garage doors and columns, but there are no walls down there. And so the upper structure is rigid. And when the earth starts to shake, the, the heavier, stiff portion above starts to sway about those lower columns and you get dramatic deflections, and then if it sways long enough, then you get a collapse. The fire that occurred in the marina was because one of those buildings collapsed on its garage, ruptured gas lines, and then ignited a fire. The buildings built after the 1970s really start to match what we consider a good design today. And those are buildings that people are safe in, buildings that can be repaired and reoccupied, because for a community to come back together, and to reestablish itself and get back to business, get its economy running again, it's got to have its buildings. With software and computers available, uh, you can actually generate three-dimensional models of structures in the computer memory. And you know, you can shake them with earthquakes, blow them with winds, and, and the software will tell you which portions of the structure are going to break, which portions are going to be overstressed, and you can go ahead and actually fix them before the earthquake actually happens. When the 1906 event reoccurs, we'd expect tremendous damage to structures around the Bay Area. In 1906, it occurred in 19 counties. It wasn't just San Francisco's earthquake. We'd expect problems of communication, loss of radio communication, loss of telephone communication, overload of those systems, damage to transportation, limited access to areas adjacent to the Bay and adjacent to the ocean fronts. This would be a major calamity. Uh, the roads are likely to separate, we know that, which will create a major problem with respect to evacuation, and that's something that the area has to focus on. Building on the foundation of what we learned from the 1906 earthquake, we now recognize that there are seven major fault zones throughout the Bay Area, each of which is capable of a major damaging earthquake similar to the 1994 Northridge earthquake or even larger. On this map, the yellow lines are the major roads and highways, and the airports are indicated. Most of the airports and roads lie in the areas we expect the strongest shaking and therefore the greatest damage. The blue line represents the Hetch Hetchy Aqueduct, brings water from the Sierra to the Bay Area. It's transected by four major fault zones. Movement on any of these will disrupt the water supply to the region. So truly, there's no safe place here in the Bay Area. In preparation for the 06 anniversary conference, the earthquake professionals of Northern California agreed upon an agenda of actions that we must undertake as residents and businesses of the region in order to reduce our vulnerability from future earthquakes. This agenda covers three broad areas of action, developing a culture of preparedness, investing strategically in mitigation and risk reduction, and ensuring adequate resources to recover from a major earthquake. It really is every person's responsibility to understand what's going to happen to their building, whether they're an owner or an occupant, what's going to happen to their building in the event of a large repeat of the 1906 earthquake. For the first 72 hours, many residents are going to be on their own. 
The question is, are they prepared to deal with that? And I think the answer is a resounding no. I think we all have a responsibility to take care of ourselves if we can. There are significant parts of our region. The populations are elderly, they're poor, they're migrants, they're non-English speaking people, they're people with disabilities who can't stock up the resources, can't take care of themselves if there's a disaster. Cooperation amongst government, uh, businesses, neighborhood organizations, uh, non-governmental organizations uh, will require better coordination, collaboration, preparation, and planning. We've not had a program that focuses just on buildings that could completely collapse. And I believe that a program that focuses on that would bring us down to a small number of buildings and it would be affordable for a community to chip in through tax incentives, through grants and bonds and all sorts of things. We need to invest in what's absolutely critical. That's why we want hospitals at a higher standard, that's why we want fire stations at a survivable standard, and that's why we need operation centers and communications that will ride out the earthquake and we won't miss a beat. The San Francisco Bay Area has made a considerable investment in strengthening their infrastructure strengthening bridges, overpasses, but because we've got so many faults running through the region, there's still much that remains to be done. If we lose a substantial number of housing units, we lose 200,000 housing units, we've got three, 400,000 people who are going to be displaced. We're going to need permanent housing. Uh, the cost to repair is very high. It's not the kind of thing that you can just take care of along the way. Uh, you need to make plans for how you're going to cover that loss. This will cause major business and economic disruption. Uh, the Bay Area needs to face this issue now and figure out how it is going to collaborate, plan for recovery, do that in a cooperative way, be together as a region and advocate at the state and the federal level for the resources that it needs. Uh, this will require a lot of money. A repeat of the 1906 earthquake could cause $120 billion in building damage alone if we consider the additional losses that might result from fires, from utility and transportation damage, from other forms of economic disruption, those losses are likely to exceed $150 billion. In addition to government, every major employer, every household that is able must take responsibility for their potential losses. Insurance and catastrophe reinsurance are two key financial instruments that we can use to help spread and manage the region's risks. Even though we've accomplished so much, we still are not sufficiently prepared for a catastrophic disaster. We earthquake professionals of the Anniversary Conference believe that with a renewed emphasis on safety and a genuine collaborative commitment to this action agenda, Northern California will rebound quickly and also safeguard its extraordinary cultural and economic vitality from the next great quake. If an earthquake like the 1906 earthquake occurred again today, we know that for all the buildings that are built prior to the 1970s, we're, we're probably going to see more damage in many of them than we'd like to see. It's 100 years ago, we did not know much about how to design structures to make them uh, seismically resistant, but now we do. Recovery and economic survival is really a partnership between the public side and the private side. When we look at San Francisco of 2006, we have to ask ourselves the question, is our political, social culture strong enough to enable us to handle a catastrophe uh, with the proper uh, skill? I'm convinced that the Bay Area can do this, but the planning needs to start now because the earthquake may occur tomorrow.